great. Well, welcome to Local Stories, um, which has now moved to a monthly format. This is our 45 minute programme of the history of local people and places. And this month we're going to look at social housing. So we'll be following a similar format to previous sessions um, in that we will start by having a short talk. Um, I'm going to do half of that, Alison's going to do half, where we'll look at the kind of context for 20th century social housing uh, and then interwar social housing is what we're going to look at particularly. Then we'll have our five minute focus, which is a focus on something from the collection or um, a, um, a building or a place in the local area. We're going to have a quick look at prefabs and then we'll finish with a little quiz um, at the end related to uh, someone I'm going to mention during the talk. We will have time for questions um, and we'll do that after the first talk um, and um, between sections. So if you've got questions, um, please feel free to ask them um, or you can post things, comments or things that you want to ask uh, in the chat function. Great, okay, so I'm gonna start by giving a little bit of a talk about the context for interwar social housing and where we were at the end of the First World War. Uh, Alison is then, as I say, going to explain to you a little bit about what happened between 1919 and 1939. I suppose it's worth saying really at the moment where some of this research has come from because our looking into social housing is very much an active project and it's something we're trying to find out more about so it might be there might be things that you'd like to share with us after you've heard uh, how much we know today. We have an active research uh, team of volunteers and we do have an active range of research projects in the museum and the aim is that they're designed to fill gaps in our knowledge uh, and in our collection and this work into social housing is really part of a broader project to better understand the town's 20th century architecture and bridge the gap between history beyond living memory and present residents lived experience. We're really trying to better understand the bridge between the much told stories of the arms houses and workhouse in Amersham with the contemporary landscape of a mix of private and social housing with some social housing later being sold off into private hands. And so what I'll be sharing with you really comes from the museum's collective body of knowledge, um, some research done by some of our volunteers, but I should particularly mention that some of the information we have um, about the 20th century social housing comes from a really excellent unpublished dissertation by a lady called Linda Amore and she looked at the development of private and social housing between 1919 and 1939. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context really about um, housing and where we were by 1919. In 1919 much of the town is still owned and influenced by the Lord of the Manor the Tirrit Drake family who live at Shardlows at the edge of the town, which is here, I'm sure you all recognise that. The main employer really was the Weller Brewery. The Maltings and Brewery are located in the town and there are many Tide pubs in the local area, which Dray men deliver beer to. Many people do also work for the Drakes, some work the land and others work in local shops. There are many examples of people working in the town in the early 20th century where the father might work here at the brewery, might work for the Drakes, whilst the wife might have to supplement the family's income with piecework. And this is a really rather lovely photograph on the left from uh, the collection of glass plate negatives that we have from George Ward. Uh, uh, collection and um, I'm sure that this lady didn't wear that outfit to do uh, straw splitting and straw plaiting but it is an example of a local person doing piecework and in the 19th century uh, and earlier piecework might have been lace making and then later straw plaiting. Many of these things are in decline in the 20th century um, and by the time of the First World War, women, rather than doing these sorts of tasks, might have helped with war work. Children would have had to have attended school to the age of 13 and this photograph on the left is an early school photograph of the girls at St Mary's School in Amersham, which was opened in the 1870s. Now, what were the options for you uh, before the end of the First World War if you had difficulty in supporting yourself in your home? Well, a few people would have had the opportunity to go into an almshouse. There are two main almshouses, Drake's, which is shown here in the top left, which was established through the benefaction of the Lord of the Manor in the 17th century, 
uh, and that's it here in the bottom left as well. And then Days, uh, Harriet Days, which is next door to the museum, more or less, and was established in 1876. But with these two houses between them, there was space for fewer than 15 women, which meant many, many other people in the town um, wouldn't have had the opportunity to be given a home here if they had themselves difficulty in supporting themselves. So what was the option for them instead? Well, this is the 1898 Ordnance Survey map of Amersham. Um, top right, if you move your, you might have your zoom picture in the way, which you can move with your cursor out the way. Top right, you'll see Newtown. Um, the railway arrives in Amersham in 1892 and Amersham on the Hill is not really established by this point. There's very little there, just a few buildings. So Amersham, as we know it, is still very much focused uh, in the old town. Um, and uh, this map really, the layout of the old town is largely unchanged today. Uh, but one of the most significant buildings and what's relevant to our discussion today is down here at the bottom, the Amersham Union Workhouse. And this really was where many people ended up before there was any kind of more systemized social housing. Amersham had had a workhouse or poorhouse from 1617 and over time this was in four different locations with overflows in four other houses. This all changed with the new Poor Law uh, Act in 1835 uh, where commissioners, commissioners had to try to decide a suitable building to be developed as a workhouse for the union. Now the union means a union of local parishes, so rather than parishes having their own workhouse, they all had to join a central unionised workhouse. Um, and it could be up to 20 parishes in one place. For our local area, it was decided that the workhouse would be in Amersham, and at the time there seems to have been some controversy that it was in Amersham and not Chesham. Um, if you're interested to know where it covers, I'll mention again at the end, there's a really excellent article, longer article on our website about the workhouse and it lists the parishes that were covered under Amersham Union, but it was 111 square miles and it would have covered about 18,000 people, um, a population of 18,000 that would have, could have gone to the Amersham Union workhouse. So here it is. Lord of the Manor, Thomas Tirrett Drake provided three and a half acres of land in Wildon Street at a cost of £300 for the new Union workhouse. Architect Sir George Gilbert Scott designed the building in an Elizabethan brick and flint style. It was designed to hold up to 330 inmates, as they were referred to at the time, and it had separate wards for men, women and children, a vagrant and tramps ward, an infirmary for sick inmates and a luxuriously furnished boardroom where the guardians of the workhouse met. Now I've studied these pictures a few times and I might be wrong, I'd be interested if you could tell me because I haven't looked at plans, but I think that was the infirmary at the end, the far end there. Um, but I'd be interested to know if that was correct. And this is another good photo from a slightly different angle. I think it gives you a sense of really what quite an imposing building it was at the time compared to the rest of the town. Um, you, you know, in this first photo, you don't get quite a sense of that, but in this one where you're looking down onto old Amersham that way, it really does give a sense of what an impact it would have had on the town and people's sense of, uh, you know, having to go there. This is a photograph of the Board of Guardians. This is the only one that we have in our collection, so it is a late photo of them. It certainly uh, doesn't refer to the first group. Um, it's interesting to note that beyond the matron, there is a woman here in the front row, and this is Henrietta Busk, who again, there's a really good article about her on our website. She's a really formidable woman locally and was certainly interested in doing her best to support people um, who couldn't support themselves. This was perhaps less the case when um, the workhouse first opened. So the first board of guardians controlled the workhouse and they would meet once a fortnight. Money was always tight and the guardians had to deal with lots of people of different ages and abilities. Partitions were erected to keep men, women and children separate, just as they had separate wards. Children were made to attend local schools where their lives must have been a real misery with teasing because they had to wear workhouse uniform. Tra tramps and vagrants were in possession of a pass and that entitled them to a meal and a night's lodging in the tramps ward, but in exchange they were expected to do a day's work before leaving. The sorts of jobs they might do included breaking flints for the roads, chopping up railway sleepers for firewood, 
whilst women were expected to help with domestic work, such as carrying fuel and water within the workhouse. Interestingly, and I think there's probably another huge story in it for itself, fit young people, especially those with young families, rather than being a burden on the workhouse, were instead encouraged to emigrate to Australia. By the end of the 19th century, public opinions began to change about the people in, um, people that were forced to be in the workhouse. And rather than treating people in there as prisoners or inmates, conditions in the union began to be much more tolerable. There was better food, greater freedom, nursing services, school for the children, uh, that was, and some of the schooling took place in the workhouse. Married couples were allowed to sleep together Treats were given at Christmas and at midsummer. And this is a photograph from 1925, so quite late on really. Uh, and this is really when once the infirmary and hospitals got much bigger, and this is a concert party, presumably for people that were in the infirmary at the time. Um, some of the other early changes that made life more tolerable was that beer and tobacco were permitted together with an allowance of tea, milk and sugar for older women, which was above the normal ration. Inmates, they were still referred to as that for a long time, were allowed to go for walks in the town and have visitors. So this, I'm sorry, it's not a very clear photo, is in our collection is labelled as the infirmary. And if I just go back to that other picture, I think that is um, this building reversed round, the photos from the other side. But again, I can see the harmers are here, they're probably experts, but someone might be able to tell me if uh, this is correct. But this in our collection is um, labelled as a photograph of the infirmary in 1903, which is also the same year a new infirmary was built to replace the old sick ward. So whether this photograph was taken to sort of document the old building before it left, I'm not entirely sure. One of the really sort of important changes is that from 1900, the sick ward had admitted all poor people. So it wasn't just people in the workhouse who were sick, it was anyone who was poor but couldn't afford medical care. Prior to that, we have to remember there was no hospital service of any sort for the general public. In 1906, another new block was built for accident cases and for, for, for contagious diseases. And much later, when war was declared in 1939, parts of the main workhouse and the hospital were commandeered to provide an emergency services hospital for the military. The National Health Service Act of 1946 abolished the old poor law system and Amersham General Hospital, which was effectively established at the end of the war, was officially acknowledged. And there's a rather nice photo here and you can see just there the sign, Amersham General Hospital. So what started as a workhouse where people were treated badly eventually evolved through the growth of the infirmary to become our local hospital. So it's at this point now that I'm going to swap over to Alison and she's going to pick up the story um, after 1919. Okay, everyone. Um, so the First World War really brings housing to the forefront again. It becomes a hot topic because it was reported that the army had to reject many potential recruits due to poor health caused by insanitary living conditions. And like most towns, Amersham had overcrowded cottages mostly in um, Norris Yard, Turpins Row and the less than salubrious terrace known as the Alley. The cottages had no mains, water, gas or electricity and until recently had relied on outdoor closets or a large bucket for the Alley. And of course the flu pandemic only made things worse. The lack of decent housing was debated at council meetings and it was reported in June 1920 that in the recent influenza epidemic 89% of the deaths in Amersham occurred in houses where the housing conditions were bad. Of course, this has parallels today um, with today's pandemic and the impact of poverty on um, outcomes. I'm going to, I'll have to roll it down by the look of it. Let me one sec. Get it that way. Okay, so um, you've got Christopher Addison on the right here, Dr. Christopher Addison, I'm sure you all recognise Lloyd George on the left. So they were the coalition government and Dr. Christopher Addison has become the Minister for Health. Um, and it was his job to fulfil Lloyd George's pre-election pledge to build homes fit for heroes or habitations fit for the heroes 
have won the war, which is what um, Lloyd George actually said, of course that's not quite as catchy, so we all remember the um, Homes Fit for Heroes instead. Now this, um, they brought in a new housing act, which was based on the Tudor Walters report on social housing, which in turn was influenced by the Garden City movement. Um, and this 1919 House, uh, Housing and Town Planning Act was a really radical piece of legislation. The report set the standard for much of the housing built in the 20th century. It detailed how spacious um, housing with proper sanitation and individual bedrooms um, could be built cost effectively and therefore offered at affordable rents. And generous subsidies were available if a tight rein could be kept on construction costs. Of course, this was very difficult when shortages of labour and materials after the war meant building costs were already very high. Um, so Amersham Rural District Council appointed a housing committee responsible for overseeing the development of new affordable housing in the town. Originally 466 houses were identified as needed, right across the district that is, and agricultural land was purchased with government loans on the outskirts of the old town. So um, here we've got land here for Back Lane and land here became Pickett's Orchard. It's also purchased land along White Line Road as well for some new housing. And five types of housing were proposed um, by the government. Identified A to E and Amersham and Chesham Boys and Coles Hill all planned houses which were type B and D. Now type B was the um, the best one, it was a parlour type house with three bedrooms and the parlour inc was included in addition to a living room because it could act as a downstairs bedroom for an injured ex-service person, ex-serviceman. Um, now these are the first council houses on Back Lane at the top here and, and this lovely photo here of the postman and um, his name, I've got that somewhere, I'll tell you that in a moment. Oh, Alfred Tilbury, so that's Alfred Tilbury, the postman who lived at number one. And the land was purchased from uh, Mr. Darvel, obviously the Darvel family, um, very well known in the area, with a government loan of £7,600. And each house was semi-detached, with an ample garden overlooking Bar Meadow at the front and Rectory Hill at the rear. And the rent was 10 shillings per week, exclusive of rates. And at the same time in 1919, new homes were built in Coles Hill and on a new development, Piggott's Orchard on Gore Hill, and down here at the right, you can see one of the first um, houses in Piggott's Orchard. More were planned on Stanley Hill, but these were never built. And in 1919, um, the Housing Committee decided that the preference for new homes was given to ex-servicemen, then widows of ex-servicemen, or mothers and children of ex-servicemen again, and after that, newly married couples without a home would be offered a new house followed by families who had outgrown their homes or families in houses unfit for habitation. The decisions of the Housing Committee were open to public scrutiny as the names of those given housing were recorded in the um, committee minutes. Now these are um, Addison Act houses um, in Chesham Boys. They were the only social housing um, Excuse me, they were the only social housing built by the Cheshire Boys Council in 1919. And they were built, um, they were designed actually, oh, thank you, Emily, that's better. They were designed by Kemp and Howe, the London based arts and craft architects who designed a lot of houses locally, mostly grand arts and craft country houses. They particularly did work for Liberty. Um, High Boys House in Cheshire Boys is one of theirs, as is Piper's. Um, at the Lee, of course. Kemp and Howe also extended St. Leonard's Church in Cheshire Boys in 1911. These houses were their first social houses built in our area, and Jesse Mead's building firm constructed them in 37 weeks, which was considered a record at the time. And Jesse Mead died himself before the work began, and Edwin East, who worked for him, again, the East family, local building firm still exists, or we know them as building suppliers, um, built these houses. Now in 1928, Cheshire Boys decided they needed another 12 council houses for their residents, but they thought it'd be best if these were sited in the Amersham parish rather than Cheshire Boys. 
which really made me smile when I read that because the current development plan that the council have had to work on recently, of course, Cheshire boys allocated their housing requirements to Aylesbury Vale at that point. So, so little changes, doesn't it? Now, in Amersham, local priority also extended the appointment of contractors. Um, Amersham Council used architects they knew, like Burgess, Holden and Watson of Beaconsfield. And builders, too, had to be based within 10 miles of Amersham, although that was extended um, to 60 miles in 1930. Now, in addition to subsidising local authority developments, the 1919 Act encouraged the formation of public utility societies. Now, I've included this photograph. It's a later one, as you can tell from the development of the grammar school, probably from the 60s. But it gives a really lovely aerial view of um, Elm Close, which I'm going to talk to you about now, which, of course, is an Addison Act um, housing development. And you can see them really clearly on aerial photos and on maps because they're usually based in round greens or there's plenty of space around them. Um, and this one is even more generous than our council housing because, of course, it was built by a public utility company. Now, these were um, public utility society, rather, which were cooperatives established to develop housing schemes for the benefit of the community. So Amersham Public Utility Society was founded by a group of local businessmen, including um, the architect Kennard and lawyer um, Alfred Ellis. And they were already involved with the development of Amersham on the Hill. But they submitted a plan for 30 semi-detached cottage style houses well spaced in a garden city arrangement around a communal green now each house had a substantial plot as you can see from the background pick of these ones on the corners of course we've now got infill houses in some of these and very generous plots and the whole idea was that tenants could grow vegetables and have fruit trees government loan was applied for and in april 1920 this parcel of land was bought sort of outlined by the whole development here and that cost them £2,000 um, in 1920 when they bought it. Now public utility societies were expected to play a major role in post-war housing but only 3,800 houses were built across the whole of England and Wales under the um, 1919 Addison Act which really shows how important Elm Close um, is a development. It was designed by Harold Kennard, as I've said, our arts and craft architect. He also Im involved his younger brother, Lawrence, and they used um, an Edmonton-based building firm um, run by Harry Monk, and they were contracted to build the houses between 1920 and 1922. Now, they follow government guidelines, this manual on the preparation of state-aided housing schemes, and that manual included strong encouragement to experiment with new materials and forms of construction. The chosen method for Elm Close, which you can see quite clearly in this photo, are these concrete, um, these concrete blockwork or cast on site. And this method saved on bricks, which of course was still in short supply following the war, but it also enabled unskilled labour to be used as it was simpler than brickwork. Again, that further reduced the cost. Other experimental features included the concrete floors, as wood was also in short supply, tiled window sills, and to avoid complex joinery, and stove enameled steel windows. Of course, we know those today as crittle, um, and these are some of the very first standard cottage windows produced um, for government housing schemes by the Crittle Manufacturing Company in Braintree. Internal facilities were also considered um, just as much as the external appearance with strict space standards and amenities such as indoor toilets, baths and hot water plumbing. Um, the semi-detached houses all share the same architectural style on the site. Their concrete blocks are pale grey brown and they've got brown roof tiles. There are decorative blocks at first floor level on the front elevations that you can make those out either side of the windows there are these decorative blocks and um, the front elevations are either left plain like this or they have another diamond design in them and some of them have completion dates there as well. So diamond patterns were a real um, signature feature of Harold Kennard's pre-war arts and craft houses. They also have front wooden front doors with a glass window insert and a traditional flat roof door canopy above the doors here. Um, which all add to the sort of cottage design of the development. So we now think Elm Close is nationally sig significant as it's a rare example of Addison Act social housing developed by a public utility society. 
Um, what also adds to its um, significance is that most of the houses have not been painted. They still survive as visible concrete dwellings, and that's extremely rare from the period. So Elm Close's designation as a conservation area will hopefully ensure the, um, its survival for future generations. So Amersham Public Utility Society planned further developments on one on Grimsdale Lane, and then the Chesham Boys Public Utility Society was formed, mostly the same men, and they planned developments on Long Park and Stubbs Wood. Of course, none of these materialised because the government subsidies were stopped in 1921. The Conservative members of the coalition thought they were too extravagant, and Addison himself resigned from the government when his housing scheme was ended. So that makes Elm Close one of the rarer surviving developments and even more special. So, and when the subsidy stopped in 1921, Amersham had built 218 houses, or was in the process of building them, so less than half the 466 requested. So in the late 20s, the council reverted to directly contracting the construction of new houses, having identified the need for 50 more houses by 1928. So 18 additional houses were built in Pickett's Orchard, and houses on Weller Road and New Road in Amersham Common Area. This is actually designed for a free bed semi on Plantation Road um, from the County Archives. And then there's photos of a very similar semi built slightly later um, on Fieldway or Hillway, just off Gore Hill. So the Housing Committee um, was concerned with the conditions of existing houses as well as the construction of new ones. And following the Housing Act of 1930, the committee was encouraged to focus their efforts on slum clearance, because we have our own famous example in Amersham, and to identify those houses considered to be unfit, and of course to rehouse those already living there, so we needed more houses again. In 1934, the survey um, was made of unfit property in Amersham, and they identified 42 houses. Of course, the notorious alley, the alley in Amersham, made up a big part of that, and those were demolished and to rehouse the occupants and farmland on Chestnut Lane, so back up in Amersham on, on the hill again, Amersham Common, was purchased together with more land from the Drakes on Gore Hill, which is what became Fieldway and Hillway, those semis I showed you earlier. And these new developments both had at least one house with six bedrooms to accommodate families of over 10 members. We know we're talking about overcrowding earlier, so some of these little cottages had, you know, at least 10 members of the same family crowded into as little as two rooms often. Um, even in the 1930s, despite the Tudor Waters report recommendations, many of the new houses only had a fixed bath. They still didn't have a proper bathroom inside. Um, the, the big argument was always cost versus quality. And this drawing from the Bucks County Archive is a elevation of four houses on Plantation Road. So the Housing Committee minute books give us a really good detail um, of the decisions that were made and the arguments that they had you know, between balancing the quality of the homes against the rising cost. So this is debates about the choice of materials, concrete versus brick, external painting or plain render, indoor versus outdoor toilets, and whether to provide gas. Um, it was going to cost £10 a house for the school lane cottages. You, you've got minutes detailing um, the arguments over fencing options. This was the kind of level they went down to. And rents was a real issue. They were set independently of costs. The Ministry of Housing stipulated the rent should not be set below two thirds of the market rate to help pay the building cost. But the Amersham Housing Committee believed this was too expensive and had to argue for reductions to make it affordable for working class people. And the whole situation, this is um, lovely photos of protest about the rent. Um, and this whole situation was exacerbated because rents were not initially standardised in Amersham and people were paying different rents in similar homes. It was eventually resolved in the mid 30s when rents were adjusted according to tenants' ability to pay. Now, they weren't only complaining about um, rent increases, um, there was also the issue of workmanship um, and problems with the houses. It's certainly no evidence that it was a golden age of workmanship as working to a strict budget and reduce workforce meant problems quickly became apparent. As early as 1923, the roofs were leaking on White Lion Road houses. A floor at number one Piggott's Orchard had to be relayed within a year. Um, there were many le roofs leaking elsewhere. 
repairs required for school lane houses, including dry rot in the kitchen. So by the 1930s, the housing committee employed their own workforce to undertake repairs of the housing stock. And I will touch on briefly um, what happened after the, the Second World War, though it takes us out of the period, but purely because, you know, we, again, we have a dramatic increase in the need for social housing, because during World War II, the population in Amersham increased dramatically, influx of refugees, evacuees, and families made homeless by German bombers. So many stayed with relatives or were billeted in the area. However, as the war ended, families were desperate to find a home of their own and to escape um, overcrowded conditions. Now, we had many army camps in the area, um, which had been built as temporary barracks. And as the soldiers left, dispossessed families seized the opportunity to move in. Now, a particularly desirable location was known as Beach Barn Camp, and it was in the heart of Chesham Boys. So it was only walking distance of local shops and also possible jobs for the um, tenants there. There was a top camp made up of 25 huts with a school playing, then the school playing field and the beacon school, which is housed in the farmhouse there, and the bottom camp with about seven huts and the farm barns. So the Barry family, and that's Elizabeth Barry and her daughter, um, originally camped in the soldiers' dance hall, which is now the dining room of the Beacon School, and they later moved into one of the corrugated tin Nissan huts, which had a concrete floor and a pot bellied stove in the middle. And Elizabeth's mother, Annie Chalice, on the left, um, who worked at the local Regent Cinema as a cleaner, is shown there with her son Jim um, outside their Nissan hut at Beach Barn. Now, some of the wartime army camps in our area were very isolated. These included Piper's Wood at Hyde Heath, which served as a reception centre for returning prisoners of war, and Hodgemoor Wood, which of course is um, far more famous on the road between Amersham and Beaconsfield. And from 1946, Hodgemoor became a resettlement camp and a safe home to over 150 Polish service, ex-servicemen and their families. And they lived in temporary buildings, barracks and Nissan huts. And conditions in the camp were very basic, but it became an established community of nearly 600 people. And we have some of these lovely photos from one of our um, ladies from the reminiscence group, Vlad, who lived at the, um, at the camp and met her husband there and her family. This is her family here on the right. So there was a church of its own priest, Father Joseph Madeja, an infant school, a post office, a library, a shop, and an entertainment hall used for meetings, plays and celebrations. I think this photo is probably taken in that hall of the um, ex-servicemen playing chess there. And many of the children attended primary school in Chalfont St Giles. So the post-war housing crisis was improved by the 1945 to 51 Labour government's provision for the building of council houses. And over time, all the families living in Hodgemoor and Beach Bond Camp were offered new council, camp, new council houses. This one on the right is in Weller Close. It was the home of Elizabeth Barry and her children. Um, so the sale of the plantation, the Weller family estate on Amersham Common meant in further development. Some of this had already happened, Weller Close and Plantation Road, but the social housing extended to cover the whole area. And... Um, develop the Quill Hall estate. There's also other developments around Elizabeth Avenue and Bell Lane in Little Chalfont. The Chalice family, Annie Chalice and Jim, moved to a council house in Cheney's village as well. And I've got a photo of um, some of the later post-war semi-touch houses that were in Wealdon Close after World War II. And you can see from these photos how little has really changed from you know, those 1919 social housing to these and 1939, you know, 1940, sorry, late 40s, aren't they? Um, Post-World War I social housing. And I'll stop sharing the screen there. Lovely. Thanks, Emily, for sorting that one out. Thanks, Alison. Um, great. So we've got time now for a few questions. Two people have pointed out that I got the infirmary wrong and it's the other side of the workhouse. Uh, in my defence, I just didn't, I, I thought it was much more foreshortened than that and it couldn't possibly be the building on the right. But um, I've looked now and you're absolutely correct. So thank you, the two people that pointed that out. Um, 
One other point I'd mention, Alison mentions the um, Housing Committee minute books. Henrietta Busk, who I showed you on the Board of Guardians, she's on the Housing Committee. So it's really interesting how she carries over her interest really in sort of provision uh, for people. Um, and it's also worth remembering that Amersham is Amersham Rural District Council. So at that time it includes Amersham, but it also includes a much larger area than you might think of as Amersham. So it includes a lot of the surrounding villages when they were making these decisions about housing. It doesn't include Chesham, but it almost includes lots of the kind of lot of the area that runs around Chesham. So they were trying to cover quite a large area, but I think many of the needs were focused in Amersham as one of the larger populations. Does anyone have any questions? You can either put it in the chat or just unmute yourself. I think Emily pointed it out at the beginning, but it's worth saying we have quite a lot of gaps in our knowledge as well. It's something we would like to find out more about. Um, I couldn't actually find the houses on White Line Road that we mentioned, so I have to walk down there. I think the trouble is we drive past places and it's much harder to spot them, so I have to take a walk down White Line Road and try and find exactly where those are. But if anyone can help us with our research into social housing, please do contact us. Okay, shall we carry on? Let's do our five minute focus next. Yeah. I've got, it's okay, I think I've got it. So five minutes on prefabs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with prefabs. Um, you might even remember the ones that were here locally. Um, you might have known someone that lived in one or you might have lived in one yourself, all of which we'd be really interested to hear about. Um, Alison's mentioned that after the Second World War, many people locally um, had to live in former army barracks like at Beach Barn, but new temporary accommodation was provided in Amersham. And in this instance, it was in the form of prefabricated bungalows or prefabs. And the Amersham prefabs were part of the government's post-war temporary housing programme. 156,625 bungalows were supplied across the country and built by 1949. 46 were built on the Finch Lane estate in Amersham. Um, and I'll show you those on here in a minute. Um, and another 40 were built on the St George's estate, which was on White Line Road. So this map is 1960, so it's a bit later. Here's the railway line in the middle. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. And here is White Line Road. And this block here uh, is Chilton Heights today. And that was where the um, prefabs were, the St George's estate. And then down here, here's the River Misbourne. And here is the London Road. Here is Finch Lane. And these are the Finch Lane prefabs, hence they were known as the Finch Lane prefabs. Now, Across the country, there are about 18 different sorts of prefabricated bungalows, different models that you could buy companies that were supplying them. Um, and the Amersham ones were a universal Mark III design, which I think by chance, not because it was close by, were made in Rickmansworth. Now the Universal Housing Company, which is listed on here, was actually part of a subsidiary of a bigger company called Universal Asbestos. Um, so it won't surprise you if you didn't know already what the panels of the prefabs were made of. Um, they're essentially flat pack houses, as you probably know, made of 26 asbestos panels and they were bolted together on a wood and steel frame. Now here we are. This is the pre Amersham prefab from Finch Lane, which is at the Chiltern Open Air Museum. So I'm sure many of you have visited that uh, and it was taken there um, when the um, prefabs were, weren't lived in anymore. It, this one was lived in as a house until 1987, so to give you an idea of how temporary it was as a, as a housing solution. Um, they were made, the material and their method meant that they could be built quickly and cheaply, which is something we've talked about already really with, um, with these sort of temporary housing solutions and social housing at a time obviously when building materials and labour was limited after the war. This model um, was 600 square foot. It had a living room. This is the living room here on the left. A kitchen, which is just through the door here. Um, two bedrooms. This is one of them. This is um, the way it's been um, dressed and presented in the open air museum. This is the children's bedroom. And then there is a master bedroom. 
um, a bathroom with a separate toilet. And another sort of genius thing about these is because furniture was also scarce after the war, there's quite a lot of built in furniture, which I think this is certainly part of that, um, which is really clever. So you've got your furniture and your building all in one go. The other absolutely genius thing about them, which again, I seem to remember when I took these pictures when I last visited inside before lockdown, uh, they had a back boiler which would back onto the living room fireplace, which is just behind the door here. And this would feed hot water to the kitchen and the bathroom um, via an airing cupboard to a sort of unit so that the hot water could get to the bath and the sink on one side and then the kitchen taps and the, the other sort of kitchen bits on the other side. So it was really cleverly designed to pack everything in together. Now this house was the home of Robert and Ethel Bryant and their three children and they lived there for a considerable amount of time um, from 1948 and when they first moved in their rent was 13 shillings and 10 pence a week. Uh, as I say the government intended that people would live in prefabs for no more um, than 10 years but many people lived in them very happily I think it's probably fair to say for decades. Um, certainly when I was a little girl near to where my granny lived, which isn't here, there were this bunch of prefabs and that was in the 80s and I was always fascinated by these incredible little homes that people lived in. Um, if you haven't visited Coam, it is actually open now, because the grounds are open to visit, so you can uh, make a trip there at the moment, although the buildings you can't go inside, um, but presumably once everything opens up in May, you'll be able to do so. But if you want to find out a little bit more about it, you can just find the page on the Chiltern Open Air Museum website. And when I was preparing for today, uh, I did a little bit of searching online and I found this really amazing resource. If you're interested in prefabs, if you put prefab museum into Google, you'll find this brilliant website where a project where um, people who have a connection with a particular prefab, either because they lived in it or a family member did, have been interviewed or they've put pictures up. So if you, um, if you Google uh, Amersham, you get uh, an interview that was done at the Chiltern Open Air Museum with Rosemary Carden, who was the cousin of the Bryants, and she has these lovely memories of visiting. So there's both an oral history interview and a transcript which you can listen to. Does anyone have any anything to say about prefabs? Anything they remember about our local ones? Or um, did anyone live in one? Hello, Sorry. Emily. It's Sue. Oh. Hi, Sue. Hello. Um, yes, my, my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law lived in a prefab in White Line Road. And I went there many times. I think one of the things that I remember about the prefab, it had a fitted kitchen. And very few people in those days had fitted kitchens with a refrigerator, which was quite a luxury item then. And everything was fitted in. Um, they loved their prefab and never ever wanted to move. Um, I can also remember the gardens were so well kept. Um, well, that's it, really. They, I, I, can re I can remember them very, very well. Yeah. Certainly the ones at Coam, they've laid it out as a kitchen mm -hmm. garden, haven't they, around the edge? To, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. They were all like that. And it was a very happy, always a very happy community because they were young people with young children, you know. Yeah. I remember the prefabs very well. Thank you, Sue. Mm, you're welcome. <laughs> I've got a slightly different story. Uh, I was, uh, or my family were evacuated from South End during the war where my father was uh, uh, working as an engraver. And we were evacuated to High Wycombe into what we called prefabricated uh, bungalows, which were actually made of breeze blocks. So they're rapidly put up. And, and, and intended to survive 10 years or so. Uh, eventually we moved out when I was, uh, we were there for, I was there for about 10 years to uh, Northampton. Would you have wanted to live in it for decades, Gary? Actually, they were remarkably comfortable. I thought that about the, the original, you know, the, the asbestos prefabs. They had a separate toilet and a bathroom, mm. say. Uh, a Rayburn boiler in the kitchen, which provided heat and hot water. 
um, and uh, three bedrooms and a long garden, which my father grew uh, vegetables and other things, kept chickens. No, we were very comfortable and a, a great com a camaraderie in the area, a great spirit amongst the, uh, all the people that lived there. It was lovely. It's interesting, isn't it, when we're at a time where we're talking about a housing crisis that, you know, some of these earlier the interwar social housing, they, you know, they were nicely designed, but not without problems with the actual buildings. And yet people have seem to have very few bad things to say about prefabs and the relative size of indoors to the outside space is interesting, too, because that runs contrary to quite a lot of modern housing, you know, tiny gardens and larger interior spaces. So. Maybe there's some, some things to learn from the prefab model, if not the asbestos panels. Um, thank you, Gary. Um, shall we finish with our quiz? Oh, was someone going to say something? Deborah? Were you yes, to... um, can I just ask, you know, with the asbestos problem, has there ever been any reports of people that lived in the prefabs in later years having a problem with it? Was it the, the you know, there's different types of asbestos, isn't there? So was, was it a good asbestos in the prefabs and everybody was healthy or do you know anything? I that? don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anyone else here does, but it would be really interesting to find out. I can offer the fact that the white asbestos, which they were made out of, is the least uh, contaminant than uh, compared with the blue, which is the nightmare. Mm. Oh. I, do have, I do have a side story about Universal Asbestos, which were a Watford based company. Uh, and when I was at school, some of my peers would get holiday work in the summer uh, to help with some of the heavy work. Um, presumably when others might have been on holiday. And I was speaking to one of these friends on Zoom only two weeks ago. Um, so he survived the most extraordinary ordeal, which was shoveling raw asbestos, dusty piles of raw asbestos from a delivery bay into the factory to be processed and made into asbestos sheeting. And of course they were given masks, but it was midsummer and it was so hot, so they discarded those. So these youths from grammar school were shoveling raw asbestos for week after week to earn good money, better than most other holiday jobs for pay. But the one I know who did that was still alive and kicking. Well, he wasn't kicking because he just had a hip replacement but I spoke to him only two weeks ago. Ah, thank you. Wow, thank you Stuart. Um, okay so for our little quiz to finish there, uh, there is absolutely nothing in anything that we've said today that will help you answer these questions so it's really just you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right for each one. I mentioned earlier that the Amersham Workhouse was designed by Sir George Gilbert Scott and uh, in, in fact he worked on several workhouses across the country um, but he was also responsible for many other uh, notable buildings so I've got five buildings that I'm going to show you and you have to say did he design it or not so it's a yes or no if you don't want to participate that's fine but if you do that's also nice and we'll see who knows their Sir George Gilbert Scott architecture. Okay, I think that's probably everybody that wants to. So I can share the results with you. There we are, you can see how people voted. Um, so everyone was correct, number one, it, it, the Albert Memorial was him. I should say now it's probably easier to tell you the answer for all of them. So assuming that um, my trusted source of Wikipedia is correct, he was in fact responsible for parts of every single building listed in my list. So I thought it would be an easy way for you to remember some of his architecture if I included all of it rather than some and some not. So um, I was really interested in what an eclectic mix it was really. Um, and there's not time to look at exactly what he did, but I think most of you would have known St. Pancras. That's the one we usually always reference. Um, but the others are listed too, as well as St Mary's Cathedral, Glasgow, and as I say, quite a few other um, workhouses which he worked with a with a with a partner on. I think some of them. So there we are. Right. So 
just a few bits to finish off. Um, if you have anything that sort of intrigued you or interested you, or you think you've got something to share with us about the topics we've covered today, I'd be really interested to hear from you. As I say, this is certainly a sort of, sort of active topic for us. Um, what, um, between now and um, these sessions are now monthly. So next month, May, we're looking at Metroland and uh, one of our volunteers, Ralph's going to be giving a talk. In June, because June is the month of refugee week, we're going to be doing a session on refugees. And July, we're hoping to do something about gardens. Um, if you would like to do something with the museum in the meantime, uh, our guided walks program has restarted since the last local story. So we're now running guided walks of Amersham every Sunday at half past two. You can book online on our website and they have been booking out, particularly because we have to limit the numbers at the moment. And our Tudor walks start again this Saturday. I think there's one ticket left for this Saturday, if you fancy finding out about Tudor Amersham and they'll be running once a month the last Saturday of the month. We have, with the support of the Rothschild Foundation, been developing some new walks and we hope to um, launch those in late June or July. So do look out for those. I'll mention those in later sessions, but we've got some new themed walks that you might like to join. And critically, um, by the next Local Stories, we will have reopened the museum. Hooray! Uh, which is very exciting. Uh, three days a week to start with. Um, uh, Thursdays, Saturdays and Sundays. So um, again, the tickets for pre-booking will go up um, on the website soon. We're also now planning some events, mostly in the garden for June and July. So again, they'll go on the website. So it'd be really lovely to actually see some of you in person if you're able to make it. We know some of you are too far away, um, but um, you know, do look out for things as they come up. Um, has anyone got any questions or anything to ask before we finish? Actually, I've got one, Emily. Is oh. there a local connection with Sir Gilbert Scott? Did he live at Latimer or have I dreamt that? Uh, he's born in Buckinghamshire. Um, I might have it up here still, actually. I can tell you. Um, I don't think it was that close. Um, but it was in Bucks. Uh, Gorecott? I don't know where that is. Yeah. North Bucks. Way. Oh, is it? Yeah. George Gilbert Scott's first church was Flaunden. That was the first church he built. He didn't build Latimer, but he mucked about with it later. His, aunt, hmm, his aunt's husband was a vicar there. And he said to him, George Gilbert, my boy, you've done all these other things. It's time you did a church. Will you come and do a church for me? He used to go there for his holidays. He didn't, he wasn't a local lad in that sense. Um, yeah, so there was a big connection. Thank you, Liz. That's a great, great fact. Thank you. Okay, I think that's probably it for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, especially now we know that you're not such a captive audience, uh, given that there are other things you can spend your time doing. So it's really lovely to see lots of you still. Um, the recordings are going up on, um, on YouTube. So if you're, there's one that you've missed or you want to send someone else, if you just Google Amersham Museum YouTube, you'll be able to find them under videos. Cool first. Okay, so I'll move your poll to there. Um, there's the first one, the Albert Memorial. Was that him or not? Number two. Is King's College Chapel, London. Number three, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Number four, St Mary's Cathedral, Edinburgh. Number five, the Midland Grand Hotel at St Pancras Station. So, send your answers in. Tell me what you think. So, I can share the results with you. There we are. You can see how people voted. Um, so, everyone was correct. Number one, it, it, the Albert Memorial was him. I should say now, it's probably easier to tell you the answer for all of them. So assuming that um, my trusted source of Wikipedia is correct, 
he was in fact responsible for parts of every single building listed in my list. So I thought it would be an easy way for you to remember some of his architecture if I included all of it rather than some and some not. So um, I was really interested in what an eclectic mix it was really. Um, and there's not time to look at exactly what he did, but I think most of you would have known St. Pancras. That's the one we usually always reference. Um, but the others are listed too, as well as St. Mary's Cathedral, Glasgow, and as I say, quite a few other um, workhouses, which he worked with a, with, a, with a partner on, I think, some of them. So there we are. Right, so just a few bits to finish off. Um, if you have anything that sort of intrigued you or interested you, or you think you've got something to share with us about the topics we've covered today, I'd be really interested to hear from you. As I say, this is certainly a sort of active topic for us. Um, what um, between now and um, these sessions are now monthly so next month May we're looking at Metroland and uh, one of our volunteers Ralph's going to be giving a talk in June because June is the month of refugee week we're going to be doing a session on refugees and July we're hoping to do something about gardens um, if you would like to do something with the museum in the meantime uh, our guided walks program has restarted since the last local story. So we're now running guided walks of Amersham every Sunday at half past two. You can book online on our website and they have been booking out, particularly because we have to limit the numbers at the moment. And our Tudor walks start again this Saturday. I think there's one ticket left for this Saturday if you fancy finding out about Tudor Amersham and they'll be running once a month the last Saturday of the month. We have, with the support of the Rothschild Foundation, been developing some new walks and we hope to um, launch those in late June or July. So do look out for those. I'll mention those in later sessions, but we've got some new themed walks that you might like to join. And critically, um, by the next Local Stories, we will have reopened the museum. Hooray! Uh, which is very exciting. Uh, three days a week to start with. Um, uh, Thursdays, Saturdays and Sundays. So um, again, the tickets for pre-booking will go up um, on the website soon. We're also now planning some events, mostly in the garden for June and July. So again, they'll go on the website. So it'd be really lovely to actually see some of you in person if you're able to make it. We know some of you are too far away, um, but um, you know, do look out for things as they come up. Um, has anyone got any questions or anything to ask before we finish? Actually, I've got one, Emily. Is oh. there a local connection with Sir Gilbert Scott? Did he live at Latimer or have I dreamt that? Uh, he's born in Buckinghamshire. Um, I might have it up here still, actually. I can tell you. Um, I don't think it was that close. Um, but it was in Bucks. Uh, Gorecott? I don't know where that is. Mm. North Bucks. James Brayway. Who is it? Yeah. George Gilbert Scott's first church was Thorndon. That was the first church he built. He didn't build Latimer, but he mucked about with it later. His, aunt, hmm, his aunt's husband was a vicar there. And he said to him, George Gilbert, my boy, you've done all these other things. It's time you did a church. Will you come and do a church for me? He used to go there for his holidays. He didn't, he wasn't a local lad in that sense. Um, yeah, so there was a big connection. Thank you, Liz. That's a great, great fact. Thank you. Okay, I think that's probably it for today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, especially now we know that you're not such a captive audience, uh, given that there are other things you can spend your time doing. So it's really lovely to see lots of you still. Um, the recordings are going up on, um, on YouTube. So if you're, there's one that you've missed or you want to send someone else, if you just Google Amersham Museum YouTube, you'll be able to find them under videos.